Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski, and for those who don't know, we're all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation into classrooms across North America and hopefully beyond. Um, really excited to start uh, this last week of April with a connection with Jut Wynn. Um, got a little intro for Jut, and then I'm going to let him take over. We, he's a conservation biologist, and he searches out cave systems that few will ever explore. So. The pursuit of these caves has taken him to the jungles of Belize, to volcanic pits uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, the driest desert in the world in northern Chile, and uh, even remote areas like Easter Island. So, and he's looking at these caves to discover what secrets they hold. So, along the way, he's discovered cave science or species unique to science. He's worked with NASA to try and figure out how you can find caves on other planets. Um, he's led over 40 expeditions, and he's been on a supporting player on almost 100 expeditions around the world and he's a member of the prestigious Explorers Club so he's had several expeditions where he's been able to carry those legendary flags to places uh, around the world and we're lucky enough to have Jut joining us today I believe from Georgia today. Jut, how you doing? Great, great Joe, thanks for having me. Oh, thrilled to have you. It's um, These sessions are always a blast and um, I think you've got some really cool things to share with us today about your explorations of caves and uh, kind of where it's led you. Yes, yes I do. So uh, thanks everybody for joining this afternoon and uh, it might be morning in some places. Uh, my name is Dr. Jet Wynn. As Joe has mentioned, I am a conservation biologist and I work specifically in caves. I study bats and bugs and that is basically the biology side of the work that I do, but I also do work with NASA, and I've been working with NASA since 2005 on various projects. Uh, what we're doing with NASA is trying to develop techniques, or I'm not trying, but we're actually developing techniques to look for caves on other planets, and because we can't just hop in a spaceship and go to the moon or go to Mars, what we have to do is we have to figure out how to find caves on other planets by studying caves here on Earth. So what I'm going to do is, today we're going to be discussing just that. And what I want to do is I want to share with you all a video first, and then I'm going to give you, I'm going to share a brief presentation on the work that I've been doing with NASA and other researchers since 2005 for the past 10 years, and then I will open up the floor to questions. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share this. It is the second option, correct, Joe, the Google Hangouts? Uh, no, no pick desktop. Pick the first one, yeah, whole desktop. All right, here we go. All right. Space researchers consider the most likely location for discovering potential primitive life forms on Mars to be in caves. But how do they find them? That was the goal of a recent NASA-funded airborne and ground study designed to aid in the detection of caves on the Earth, the Moon, and Mars. The purpose of this study is to learn how to detect caves on Earth and then apply the techniques that we developed for detecting caves on Earth to looking for caves on Mars. When a doctoral candidate at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff and a researcher at the SETI Institute, flew two missions aboard a NASA King Air research aircraft in April 2011. The flights over lava fields in California's Mojave Desert collected both thermal and visual imagery to aid in detection of caves. We are basically coupling those ground-based measurements that we're currently collecting with the thermal imaging data and the vis data that we're collecting as well. Through developing techniques for detecting caves on Earth, we can then take those techniques and use them to look for caves on Mars. NASA Goddard engineer Mirzi Javala operated a NASA photo detector that imaged the temperature variations of the caves and surrounding surface that occur as a result of the heating effects of the sun. This thermal data will be compared with similar ground-based measurements. Wynn noted that there's a secondary reason for developing cave detection technology. Another important aspect of the study as it relates to the importance of Martian caves, is that these caves could also serve as astronaut shelters. Oh, that's so cool. 
Wynn envisions this research will contribute to the development of selection criteria that could identify suitable cave targets for future robotic exploration. If life ever existed on Mars, we're going to find that evidence under that. All right, so one thing that I wanted to discuss with you all first before I jump into this presentation is you all might be wondering how does an ecologist start working with NASA in that capacity by looking for caves on other planets and the way in which I have done that is I have been as an ecologist I was also working with remote sensing and I was actually using remote sensing and what remote sensing is is using satellite images and aircraft images and then using a lot of fancy math to try to figure out how to look for habitat and how to identify habitat of other of animals and by doing that I was able to develop this these skills in using remote sensing images images from satellites and through that I was ultimately able to start working with NASA to look at thermal images to look for caves on other planets but starting obviously here on Earth. So what I wanted to speak about today is, is uh, planetary cave exploration and, and I'm calling this a, this is a, this is a multi-stepped approach because what we have to do before we can go to Mars and explore caves on Mars there's a lot of things that have to be done first here on Earth and once we've done those things I believe that we will one day be living in caves on Mars. So for those space enthusiasts in the audience, uh, this is some information about where we are in terms of moving forward and ultimately having the spacecraft to get us to Mars. And what we have right now is we have two spacecrafts that are in development. One is the Space Launch System, which is developed by NASA. It is destined to be the largest spacecraft ever flown. It's a tremendous rocket and it's going to have uh, the heaviest, uh, the, the greatest heavy lift capacity so we'll be able to move more people and more weight into space than we ever have before with this system. Also there is uh, by SpaceX a spacecraft called Falcon Heavy and that is one of their rocket ships and that rocket is uh, going to be the second largest uh, also, I recently read an article in, uh, that was released regarding China's move to get us to Mars, or to get them to Mars specifically. And so they're ramping up their efforts. So what we have right now is we have NASA, we have SpaceX, which is a private company, and then we also have China that is trying to go to Mars. And all of us are now entering into the space race of sorts to get us to the Red Planet. But before we can even entertain that idea of going to Mars, we have to figure out where the caves are here on Earth and be able to identify them with a, with a high level of certainty that we are in fact looking at caves when we're looking at those images because, because obviously we can't just go to Mars, walk up to the edge of a, what we think is a cave and look down and go, yep, that's a cave. We can't do that. We have to look at these satellite-based images to do that. And this is an example of an image that we took, uh, golly, it was back in 2005. And this was part of the very, the, the first work that we did uh, regarding this question. And what we did is we just took, we just went to several caves throughout the southwestern United States, and we just stuck a thermal imaging camera in front of the entrance. And we wanted to see when was the best time, just based on taking pictures using thermal imaging, that we could actually see the cave. And what we did is we divided the 24-hour day into four periods. So what you have here is we have the late evening. And this was supposed to be early morning, but because this was on a north-facing slope, we were, able to, we were able to capture this at almost 9 o'clock. And for those of you who, who've, who've looked, who know about mountains, you'll know that on the north side of the mountain during the winter, the snow will actually remain a lot longer into the spring than it will on the south side because the south side receives more sunlight and more and thus more heat and that's what we were able to see here so even though it was 9 a.m. it was actually like it was much earlier in the morning anywhere else on the ground surface because we had that shaded effect going on and then we also took in the midday here at one o'clock and then also in the late afternoon and what we're able to see here 
is that by by taking the images early in the morning or or late in the evening, boy, these caves just lit up like Christmas trees. However, when you when we captured those images during the day, it was a lot more difficult to see the cave, and we thought that during these two time periods, we were going to have difficulties in finding caves. And also, this is always something I like to point out. Is this right here? This is a pack rat. And I was actually watching it through the video camera. He started here, and he kind of went along, and then I was like, man, I got to take a picture of him. So I did. But that's a pack rat right there. He was moving across, and you can see he even glow glowed in the dark, so to speak. And then another thing that we needed to do is we needed to collect temperature data from caves. And we did this in southern Chile. This was part of our very early work. This was in, you can see here, this was in 2006. And what we did was we, it was, it was very low tech uh, to a certain extent. We, we took these temperature instruments and we put them in the entrances of, this is a cave here that we were studying in, in southern Chile. We put, a, we put a temperature instrument in the entrance and this cave had two entrances, so we put it in the other entrance. And we also put one on the surface. And we were collecting the temperature over an, uh, at an hourly rate, so we're collecting the temperature data every hour for those three locations. And what we're able to see here is that you would expect, because you know when we go outside, we, we notice that when the sun's very hot, it's at its highest point during midday, and then it cools down at night because the sun goes down. We have this, we have this diurnal or daily fluctuation in temperature. It gets hot during the day and it gets cool at night and that's what we saw in the temperature the surface data but what we saw when we were looking at the temperature data for the cave entrances was something that we expected but we were able to demonstrate here with this data is that there wasn't much variation in the entrance between day and night so what that told us is that we would be able to detect the cave if we flew an aircraft over this cave during this time period here when, it's, when the temperature is the greatest, perhaps during midday, but you saw from those earlier images that that might not work out so well, so we might want to look in this region here at night when the ground surface is coolest and the cave entrance would be the warmest. And as our work continued, what we were able to do is we then took this uh, a camera that was developed by NASA and we put it in the entrance of a cave in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. And what we see here, this is just a this is just a video where we took thermal images every 10 minutes over 24 hours, so over an entire day. And what you can see here is that it was just kind of neat for us because we were able to see how it changed over time. Once again, we can see here at left, we can see that at midnight, this entrance here glows in the dark, and during the day, it is this, this cool feature on a warm landscape. And just so you have a little bit of an idea as, in terms of what this is, to get into this cave, we were actually studying this cave using the same approaches that you saw in that previous slide where we put instruments in the cave to collect temperature data. We have to rappel 30 feet to get into this cave. So we had to we put ropes here and then we rappelled into it. And then this was some of the earliest work that we did when we flew that aircraft mission that you saw in that NASA video. And what we did is, is if you've ever taken a picture that you take on your phone or that you take with your iPad and you and then you bring it into to any any program that you can use to alter the contrast on your picture you can see that by doing that you're basically changing the appearance of that image that you're looking at and that's what we did here when we were looking at this cave entrance here we basically just did, we just use these different these different buttons, if you will, that were in this program that we were using to see by pressing those different buttons how different did this feature appear. And what we were wanting to do is we were wanting to find the best approach, the best approach that we could use to identify differences so we could find the best techniques to identify caves. And then what we did, and this is something that gets, we, we're going to get a little complex here, but I, I still wanted to share this with you all because this is science happening. This is, this is we're, we're doing this work right now. We're working on a paper. We're just about to submit it to a science journal for publication. So to me, this was really exciting. This is, we're taking the images that we collected on a NASA aircraft, and then we're going from there to sitting behind a computer for hours and hours and hours processing the data. 
And then once we did that, we were able to identify these different techniques that we could use to identify caves. And once we were able to do that, we can then write this up in our paper and say, here's the best techniques that NASA can use for finding caves on Earth. They're going to be useful for finding caves on Mars and the Moon. And this is how we should proceed when we're identifying the places that we want to explore for life and we want to evaluate as potential astronaut bases. So what we did is they're, they're called terrain analysis. And what we did is, th this, is this is an example here. This is, a, this is the image of the Mojave Desert. This is our cave entrance right here. And we took these different approaches. And the first one that we use is called a topographic position index. And what we did is you can read here, we're just looking at a value of a given pixel and we're comparing it to the average values around the pixel to develop this layer. It's just a different layer, so it's basically like pushing a button that I was mentioning earlier when we're looking, when you're, you're adjust, adjusting the contrast. If you can imagine adjusting the contrast on your, your picture of your family and you can just push a button and it, it does something really cool and it might have some weird effect to it. And you're like, wow, that's kind of neat. I want to share that with my family. Well, that's kind of what we did with science. So we were looking at this first approach, and then we took a, a gradient here, which is our next little layer that we used. And what we were doing is we were basically just tweaking by using this, this mathematic equation that looked at this entire image, which is really crazy when you think about it, but it works really well. And we were able to look at how temperature changes quickly on that thermal image. And then that created another layer that we could use for analysis. And then our final approach where we were, you know, pushing those buttons, if you will, was looking at the, the curvature. And basically what that happens is when we look at areas where there is a significant change in temperature, it either increases or decreases, that is basically creates this contour map where it is, is depicted as uh, regions of, of concativity like dips or convexivity, which are, would be peaks and valleys. And we're able to develop that final layer. And then, and then what we also want to do is we said, well, how good is just that raw thermal image that we took? Can we use that for anything? And these are some examples here. Uh, what you can see here is you can see this is the actual images of, uh, this is a thermal image here. And you can see these caves here in the thermal. And then what we did here for the night imagery is we took the, you can see the the uh, the caves here. These are the cave entrances and how they glow. And then this is the day imagery here, and you can see the caves. It's a little more difficult, but you can see these dark features on a lighter surface. And then you're looking at uh, the difference, and this is what we did. Is This is just basically a very simple subtraction that we did because if you know about pixels, each individual pixel, so when you zoom in on an area, each individual pixel in a thermal image will have a value. And it might have a, it'll have like from one to... Gosh, I think that it's over a thousand for the top, the the high end of the value. And what we did is we did a difference where we just subtracted those values for each pixel for the night from the day, and we created this layer. And what we're able to show, which I thought was just absolutely fantastic, is through that analysis, we were able to make predictions. So what we were able to do here is we were able to, by looking at where we knew the caves to exist, we then told this this mathematic equation to then look, we, by using this mathematic equation, we're able to enter it into a program and say, okay, well, look for all these features that look like this on the landscape. And what we're able to do is we were able to find a lot of areas that look like caves, but we don't know if they are caves yet, which is where we then enter the field again. We will be doing that in the fall. We will then be going into the field and then seeing by our, making our predictions here, in the laboratory, we, well, we will then go back into the field and see if any of these things that we have predicted to be caves are actually caves. So what we'll be doing for our science paper that we'll be submitting in the next couple of months is we will, be tell, we will basically just provide a list of predictions and then say, more to come. Stay tuned. And these are just some other examples here where you can see where these predictions were made using that mathematical equation that I mentioned earlier. So when that next step, so now that we've, ha we've been able to demonstrate that we, golly, we can find caves using thermal imaging and we can make predictions based on where caves are going to be and we have made, we've significantly advanced 
that step in finding caves on Earth and being able to apply those to other planets, the next obvious step would be to where are the caves on other planets. And I'm going to be focusing specifically today on the Moon and Mars. Now the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a spacecraft that is orbiting the Moon, the images collected from that have resulted in a, the identification of over 200 lunar pits. So these are caves. We actually believe these big holes to be associated with caves. On Mars, it's even more cool in my opinion because this was the first work that I was involved with back in 2007. We actually published a paper on this. And we had at the time, we had just these seven pits. Since then, my friends that I work with have identified over 2,000 pits and caves on Mars. So we know of a lot of caves to exist on the surface of Mars. And that next, the next step that we have to, to take in terms of now that we know that there's caves on Mars, we will still need to use some thermal imaging to, to do some of those tests that I showed you in that earlier uh, in those earlier slides. But what we'll then need to do is we'll then need to be sending in robots to look for life. And this is some work that I participated in a couple of years ago. I was the first human being to belay a robot. I'm basically, I am the robot safety. You can see here the rope. You can see me. I have my harness on and I'm keeping this robot safe. And this is called Lemur. This is the world's first rock climbing robot. And it turned out that I was the world's first human to belay a robot on rope. This is my friend that developed this robot. He works for NASA JPL. And what you can see here is you see these feet on the lemur. And what they have is they have little spines on each individual toe. And that's what enables this robot to move and grab onto the rock and to be able to climb the rock. But what you can also see here is you can also see that this engineer here, she has a computer and she's pulling the cables associated with it up right now. Well, the reason we have a computer is right now, Lemur has to be told how to do everything. It has to be told how to move its foot. And each individual command is a line of computer code. And watching this robot move is similar to watching grass grow in your yard. It is very, very slow. It'll put you to sleep. So what we ultimately will see as this technology progresses is that we will have a robot at some point in the future that will be able to make those decisions by itself. It will be able to, much like a rock climber would look at a rock and, and look at a whole, look at a place where it could, where the rock climber could could put her hand to grab on so she can climb and to put her toe in a place to make that next move. Lemur here will then be ha will have that knowledge to be able to look at the rock and say, okay, this is a good place right here for me to place my foot. I'm going to get a good grip here. And this will be the next place that I'm going to place my foot. And it'll be able to make those decisions and ultimately climb by itself. Now for us, this was really cool. My, my friends at JPL just sent Lemur to the International Space Station. The last SpaceX rocket that went up, and you can see here it was on, uh, golly, I think it was the 23rd of March is when that last SpaceX rocket delivered a big supply of equipment and experiments to the International Space Station. Amongst all that equipment was a lemur robot. And the whole purpose behind these experiments that the astronauts will be conducting with lemur is essentially to create and a, a real life R2-D2, a robot that can walk along the exterior of a spacecraft, inspect the spacecraft, and one day make repairs to the spacecraft. Now, you saw that in that previous slide, what we had is we had this gripper technology for walking on rock. Well, for this particular robot, Lemur uses a different gripper technology, and it actually is a gecko gripper. And that is a, it's, it's just like a, a gecko's foot. Instead of having spines, it has this adhesive that enables it to grab on to the smooth spacecraft surface and to be able to walk along it. 
And the final phase of cave exploration, planetary cave exploration, will be the development of spacesuits and related technologies. Because the way that I envision this working is we'll find the caves, we figured out how pretty well how to find caves on Earth using remote sensing, using thermal images, using, using visual images, visual spect spectrum imagery, and we now know how to, f and we've now found a lot of caves on the moon and Mars. We now have to evaluate those caves using, using thermal images and visual spectrum images. And before we will send humans in, I believe we will need to send in robots. So we now have that lemur technology that can get us there, that can go into these caves and examine those caves. But also, those robots could go into caves with a payload, is what we call it, the scientific instruments on board that space, on board that robot to look for evidence of life. And we would be looking for evidence of life on Mars. Now, once we did that, humans will then be moving into caves on Mars. I believe that at some point, hopefully within my lifetime, but definitely within all of your lifetimes, we will return to being cavemen and cave women. We will be going into caves, we will be living in caves, we will have astronaut bases in caves because the surface of the moon and the surface of Mars are very inhospitable, not a good place to pitch a tent. You don't want to live there. But in the caves, it's going to be very comfortable. And what I'm doing right now is I'm working with Johnson Space Center and we're developing, we're going to be developing a proposal to develop techniques to and equipment to actually work safely underground. And this is a nice little artist concept of what I envision that to look like. And part of that ver those very early tests is I will be wearing a spacesuit like this, I will be wearing traditional rock climbing equipment, and I will see how well I can operate that equipment wearing these big Mickey Mouse gloves. And then obviously that, that, final, that final phase in would be human settlement. So once we have, this, once we have the, that's those spacesuits and that related equipment developed and tested and we know that it's going to work, it's then time to set up our nice little happy home. And this is another artist concept of what we believe uh, living underground could potentially look like. But I don't think it's going to be th this hard metal capsule that we would live in because if you think about it, when we put something into space, it costs a lot of money. I think the, the current estimate is for a gallon of water, it's about $15,000. So it's, it's kind of like buying a car. Cars are actually a little bit more expensive than that, but let's say buying a nice, a decent used car. So it's very expensive to send up a gallon of water. So would we send up something like this, or would we send up something like this? Now this is in, a, in an inflatable habitat. So basically what you could do is this, would, this could reduce down to a very small size. You insert it into the entrance of a cave, you push a button, and it blows up much like blowing up a balloon. But the biggest question here is, are we going to be going to Mars anytime in the near future? Now, all of those things that I just shared with you, with the exception of the technologies for finding caves, all of that equipment, that, those robots that I showed you, the, the ideas that we have for developing what I'm calling a speleonaut toolkit, a toolkit for astronauts to use working underground, and then, of course, those habitat pods, all of those technologies are in very early stages of development. NASA refers to those as, refers to the readiness level of technology as technical readiness levels, and we call them TRLs for short. And what, what NASA does is they rate those on a scale of zero to 10. Zero is just, hey, I have this great idea, what do you think? And then it ramps all the way up to 10, being it's ready to fly on a mission. And right now, all of those technologies, the robots, the spacesuits, the equipment uh, for working underground, and even those habitat pods are at very low technical readiness levels. I would say between zero being the ideas that we have for the, the speleonaut toolkits to probably a five, four or five for the robots. So there's a lot more work that NASA has to do. There's a lot more work that the private space industries have to do. And perhaps even China will get on board with helping us move these technologies forward. 
So with that, thank you all very much. But before I open up this to questions, I wanted to share with you all something else. And I'm going to go over this briefly. I'm going to give you all some, some links where you can follow me if you would like. I, as you know, I'm also a conservation biologist. I'm going to be on Easter Island for three months this summer. We're going to be working, we're going to be looking for endemic bugs because you can see here, this entire island used to be a tropical, a subtropical forest. Today it is a grassland because of uh, human induced activities that was. Uh, that was caused largely by a very fragile ecosystem. And what happened is it was converted from that subtropical forest to this grassland here. So what we think is where the endemic or native bugs are going to be, are going to be along the cliffs and the crater lakes, along the rocky shores and in caves. And we've already found 10 native insects in caves that are believed to be restricted to caves. Now the reason why bugs are so important on Easter Island is because all of the terrestrial vertebrates, all of the larger animals, have gone extinct. Most all of the plants that were native to the island have also gone extinct. So the bugs, unfortunately now for Rapa Nui is where it's at. So that's where conservation is going to happen and that's what I'm working to do this summer. I'll also be going to French Polynesia. I will be visiting this island to conduct the world's first cave biology inventory of caves on these islands that are part, uh, this is Rurutu, and it's a part of the Austral Island chain. And then finally, in next spring, I will be going and we will be doing this large scale effort to look at biodiversity of caves in Southern Spain. And we will also be developing three dimensional models of caves, which we can use which will come in quite useful for the NASA work, but will also be useful in looking at cave biology. And here's my website, and the teachers can contact me if they have any additional questions, and I'm also on Instagram and Twitter. And with that, I can now open up, uh, let's see here, let me do this. Yes, now I can answer any questions that you all may have. All right, Jut, you're back. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much for taking us on a little trip through some of your some of your research. It looks like you've got an action-packed several months coming up, so we'll definitely have to connect again, maybe after the Easter Island or something. It looks like that would be a fun expedition to check out how it went. Um, let's introduce the classes, and then we'll get some questions. So let's see. We have uh, Mrs. Barches, grade sixes from Thunder Bay in Ontario, so Canada. Uh, Mrs. Edgar's fourth graders are joining us from Hutchinson, Kansas. We've got room 21 fifth graders from Los Gatos, uh, California. We have Mrs. Dorf's grade eights joining us from Taylorville, Illinois. Mr. Greenfield's grade fives, Freehold, New Jersey. And last but certainly not least, we have Mrs. Uh, Zeisler's grade fours from McPherson, Kansas. So a great group of classrooms from right across North America today. Um, let's open things up. Let's just pick, there we go, our grade fours in Kansas. This is Edgar's. Hello. Hey, Don't be shy. Come on up. Do you have a favorite cave? That is a great question, and I get that quite often. What is my favorite cave? And I would have to say that I do not have a favorite cave. I, I have favorite places where I like to work. Um, I love to work on Easter Island. This will be my fifth trip to Easter Island. And the reason why I don't have a favorite cave is because caves are one of the last places on Earth that we have to explore. That in, in most cases, there are so many caves that are just completely unexplored, but even the explored caves I have been into a cave 20 times, and I will go in there and I will see something that I've never seen before. So for me, it's very difficult to say I have a favorite cave because as soon as I tell you all that, oh, this is my favorite cave, then I go into a, the, a cave that I'm like, oh, this is boring. And then I find a Native American artifact that no one has ever seen before. And that to me is one of the most amazing things of caves is that I'm always finding something new, even in those caves that I've been to many times. All right, good question. Let's snag another one. 
from Hutchinson, Kansas. <laughs> Here she comes. All right. Um, do you ever get nervous going into new caves? Do I ever get nervous going into caves? Uh, you know, I have not. Um, and, and the reason why is because when, when we're doing this work, it well, one, I'm not claustrophobic, and that obviously helps. If, if you're afraid of small spaces, you don't want to go into caves. That's, that's not a good idea. Uh, so fortunately, I'm not claustrophobic. And, and I also, with the work, I, I'm doing everything that I do for science. And to me, that is very important. So I don't have time to think about, okay, is this dangerous or not? I mean, certainly when we're working underground, we're, we're always cautious. We make, we, we, we make what are called calculated risks. Uh, when we're using ropes, when we're repelling hundreds of feet into caves, I, have, I work with people that are very, very well trained. And what we do is we always ask each other, hey, do you like this? Do you like the way that these ropes are set up? Is this, are you comfortable with this? And we make sure that everybody is comfortable. And once we know that, then we know that we're going to be okay. Another thing that we do is we have the buddy system in place. And whenever I have my, all of my equipment on, the thing is, is what we'll do is, is, we'll, is I'll have a buddy that will look at me and look at all of my gear and make sure that everything is set up correctly. And that way, that also helps me to not be scared and not to be worried about getting hurt because I know that at that point, when I get onto that rope and I go into that cave, I know that we've done everything possible to make it as safe as possible before we start doing the work. Okay, let's visit um, our grade eights in Taylorville. Your microphone's on. Okay, I think we have a couple of questions. I'll have them up front. What life do you expect to find on the moon and Mars? So, so what do I ex what what do we expect to find in terms of life on the moon and Mars? Well, on the moon we don't expect to find life, but on Mars we know that there was once wa a lot of water on Mars, and today we still know that there is a lot of water on Mars. We're pretty much everywhere we look on Mars, we're finding water, which is crazy. It's great because we know, based on looking at Earth, we know that where there's water, there's life. And that's what, we, and that's what we're, we've been doing in terms of studying Mars is we're following the water. We're looking for the water. And those are the areas that we've been identifying as the best places to look for life. Well, there's something we have to consider on Mars is that with, with cosmic radiation beating down on the surface of the red planet, it's not like Earth where we have this protective atmosphere that shields us from a lot of that bad stuff coming in from, from the sun and from outer space into our planet. We're insulated to a large extent. On Mars, it has a very thin atmosphere, and a lot of that bad stuff gets right through. That, the cosmic radiation hits the surface, and it sterilizes the surface. However, underground is going to be protected. Now, I don't expect that we're going to see little green men. I don't think we're going to find Martian bats, although that would be really cool if we found Martian bats. And nor do I think we're going to find bugs. What I do think is we're going, if life existed, ever existed on Mars, we're going to find microbial life. We're going to find something similar to what we have here on Earth, bacteria, archaea, fungi, those sort of things. That's what we're going to find, if it ever existed. Uh, we might find fossil evidence of some bigger critters in caves as well. Uh, but in terms of what that would look like, I have no idea. Maybe it would be a little green man. Who knows? All right, great question. You guys have another one? Oops, I should probably turn their microphone on. That would make it easier. There we go. Have you ever gotten lost in a cave? <laughs> have I ever gotten lost in a cave? Uh, well, you know, I'm a guy, so I'm never going to admit that I was lost, right? Isn't that what your dad does? Your dad's like, no, nah, I got this. And you've been driving around in circles for hours, and he's like, nah, I still got this. And he's clearly lost, but he's not going to admit it. No, but seriously, uh, yes, we, we we I wouldn't say we've ever been lost, but we have been turned around. And that happens, that, that does happen, not often, but it, it happens, it, it does happen on occasion. Um, what we have is we have, when we're working in caves, I've always said the science is always going to be as good as your cave map. 
So when, when we work in caves, we have these maps of the caves. So we have all the passages, all, no matter how, how curvy and, 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 and you know, worm-like those passages are, we have those mapped out. And, and some caves are like mazes, but if we have a good map and, we ha and we're able to look at that map, it's much like you having a, a, a good road map of a city that, you're, that you need to, to navigate through. And that's what we do. We just have a good map. And as long as we have a good map, we're for the most part we're going to be we're going to know where we are. Um, but obviously, there are cases where you're exploring where you don't have a map, and th that that tends to be where folks get a little turned around and, and might get lost for a little bit of time. But we always find our way back. And whenever we do that sort of thing, we have what are called flags. We have these we have flagging tape, this roll of fluorescent tape. And if we're going into an area that we we've never been in before, we might you know put some flagging tape on some rocks as we're going in. And that way we can quickly find our way back out. Okay. Smart way to go about it. And I think that's an important thing for any kind of exploration or um, sports, even something like scuba diving. If, if you're careful and you follow the rules, you're well prepared, generally you can avoid situations uh, like that. So let's see. How about Mrs. Zeisler's class? Your microphone is on. Great. Do you have a favorite bug that you found? That you found? Do I have a favorite bug? <laughs> um, well, I do have a bug that is named after me, and oh. that one's pretty cool. Oh. Let me, I, I, I can probably quickly find it. And so, so I would have to say, because it's my baby, uh, <laughs> that it would be one of my favorites. Here, I'm going to show you a picture. So cool. Uh, let's see here. Where'd it go? Oh, it's loading. Here we are. Let me share this real quick. And this is the one it is named after me. It looks like a beetle. It is a beetle. And for you all on the, on the West Coast in California, you've probably seen these walking around. Uh, there, there's a large number of species of these beetles that occur throughout the southwestern U.S. and throughout the West Coast of North America. So cool. <laughs> All right, very cool. Not a lot of people can say they have a, or an insect or any kind of animal named after them, so that's a pretty cool thing to have. Let's see. Uh, All right. Okay, go ahead with another question if you have one. How did you feel when you discovered the new bugs? Um, well, okay, th this, is, this, is a, this is a cool part of science, and it's a really good question in terms of, of cave biology, because when, we, when we're looking at bugs, um, we don't always know that we have new species. Uh, some of them are going to be really difficult uh, to know whether or not they're a new species. So, for example, with this guy, when we found this guy, Did it share? Did the screen share? Uh, nope, not yet. Okay. So when we found this guy, we knew that it was a new species. And the way that we knew is it was cave adapted. This animal, it has no eyes. It has these crazy long legs. It doesn't have any pigmentation. It's this white yellowish color. It has really long antenna. And the hair on its body and the antenna is how the animal sees and feels its way around in the dark. And when we look at those animals, we know, hey, if we're the first one in the cave and we find this little booger, most likely it's going to be a new species. But when we find other things like that, for example, that, that beetle that was named after me, it's an animal that also can occur on the surface because it is it's not cave adapted. It's not limited to existing only in the cave environment. And there's a good possibility that somebody stumbled upon it before and has, has described it. 
So we don't always know that we have new species. So some of them are a bit of a surprise for us. But these type of animals are going to be something that we would know immediately. And these are the things that we get really excited about when we find these type of animals in the field, these cave adapted animals. We're the first one in the cave and we find something like this. This is a centipede. You know, this guy, this, this guy chomps the beetles that you just saw in the earlier uh, slide. And, you know, he eats them for dinner. And so these, this, is, this is something that we, we get really excited about, and we get really happy, and we're like, man, this is great. And the reason why we get excited is not just because we want to be able to describe this new animal and name a new species, but because the more animals like this that we find in a cave, the more information that we have to say, this cave is really important, and we need to protect this cave. And then we can make recommendations to whoever owns the cave. Maybe it's the federal government. Maybe it's, you know, Bob down the street. And we can say, hey, we really need to protect this cave because we've got to protect the home of these little critters. And that's why we get excited is because we can, we can make a difference here on Earth by making those recommendations to protect life on Earth. All right, let's jump to New Jersey. Mr. Greenfield, grade fives, your mic is on. How did you discover the, uh, how did you discover the types of, um, of the type of bugs um, that were in the cave? How do we discover the bugs in the cave? Well, okay, that's, and that, that's a really good question because it's not like I just walk in the cave and I sit a bag down and everybody starts hopping in going, hey, we want to be caught, we want to be described. So what we have to do is we, we sample them and we use all these different techniques. We set these traps throughout the cave. We lay out baits that attract the bugs. And then the bait, just like you know, somebody's got goldfish right there or something, hey, the bugs might like that. And we, and we lay those down, and now she's hiding it. She, oh, you're going to get in trouble for eating. Uh, so, so anyhow, that, that's, that's what we do. We set a lot of baits out, we spit, and then we, and we go to these caves a lot, uh, like three, four times, sometimes for a given project, where we're always collecting everything that we see. And because the thing is, is when we go and we collect these animals, we can't just collect one and be able to say it's a new species. Sometimes we have to collect a large number of them, like five or six because it takes a, 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 a sample of those different animals so we can, so we have both male and female, so we have some of the individual, the, the juveniles, the, the babies, and we can then have a good idea as to how to best describe and identify the animals because we're not always describing new species, we're also, describe, we're also identifying things that we already know about. So that, and, that's, and that's another part of the work. So, we, so basically what we have to do is we look at this, there are all these papers and books and books and books that, that have these descriptions of what these animals will look like. And we have to turn the pages and look at all these descriptions and all, these, the, and all this information that says exactly, okay, if it has legs that are this long, it might be this. Go to the next line. And then and we, it's called a key, a taxonomic key. And we have to work through each one of those taxonomic keys. And when we get to a point where we're like, it's not in the key. That's when we know that it's probably a new species. And at that point, we start to work to describe it as such. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. This is Watts. Please call extension. I know you found some new bug species in caves. And how would you figure out the name of that new species of bugs when you discover it? Or do you make the name yourself? That's a really great question. So, so how, do we, how do we come up with the names for these new species? Well, it depends. Uh, and, and yes, we, we, do, we do come up with the names ourselves. Um, and what I have been doing, for example, for the work on Easter Island, what we did was we named the animals using words and phrases from the Rapa Nui language because on Easter Island they speak a language that is, is very similar to native Hawaiian. It's a Polynesian language. So we came up with phrases for each one of those new species. And we also found a new species of, of millipede in, 
in New Mexico and we decided to use a, a word or it's actually a phrase from the Zuni language and Zunis are, are so, some of the Pueblo Native Americans from south, the southwest so we used a word that was that was meant many-legged bug of the moss because it occurred in the moss so that's what we named him so so we so we we can and oftentimes and what we can also do is we might name it after a colleague someone that we know that has has helped us with the work or is very important in the local community where we're working so for me as a scientist what I try to do when I'm working because I work all over the world I will often use words from that area where I'm working to honor the culture and the people where I'm who I'm working with All right, another great set of questions. Mrs. Mills, your microphone's on if your classroom has a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Ree. Louder. Hello, my name is Ree. I was wondering, uh, what are the hottest and coldest temperatures you have ever been in in caves? The hottest and coolest temperatures in caves? Well, the coolest would have to be the ice caves that I've worked in in western New Mexico. And they're called ice caves for a reason, because they are cold during the winter. And sometimes there are these big, these big columns of ice, these stalactites and stalagmites that are, that are coming from the ground and, and, the, and the ceiling, and they're made of ice. And it's really cold in those caves. So I would say... Obviously, if there's ice, right, it's going to be below freezing, so it'll be, so it's at least zero degrees uh, Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But oftentimes, they're a lot colder than that. Um, the hottest cave that I've ever been in, holy moly, I would have to say probably there was this cave in in the Mojave Desert, and it was in it was in the middle of this big lot, this big. Uh, lava bed, so where this old volcano had spewed lava and it rolled over the surface, and and it was mid-April, early May, and the sun had been beating down on that sucker all day, and the rock was hot, and, and over time what happens is in some of these caves they absorb that heat, and they can become quite warm, and that one was, boy, I was sweating. I don't know how hot it was, I, it was but it was well over 100 degrees. Um, I haven't been in any caves where I have to wear special protective suits because it's so hot. Uh, obviously, when it's really cold in a cave, we just bundle up. We just bring a couple of jackets, and that, that helps us get through uh, whatever work we need to do and be comfortable. Uh, but I would have to say that the hottest would have been in the Mojave Desert, the coldest in western New Mexico in a nice cave. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay, You're welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Natalia. Uh, what? What made you want to explore caves? What made me? Well, I'll share something with you. This is where I am right now. This is where I grew up. You can see out there, there it's a marsh, and there's trees, and there's forest. I'm on St. Simons Island, Georgia. And as a little boy, I used to, I would disappear for hours, and my parents would get very upset with me because I would just be going out and exploring. So that's what made, I think I became an explorer at a very young age. I became interested in the natural world. I was, I was that little kid that would flip over logs to see what was under them. And I would catch turtles and snakes and alligators and raccoons and all sorts of stuff. And I'd bring it home to mom. Mom, look what I got. Baby alligator. She'd be like, Get it out of the house. And I'd get in trouble. And, but that's what I used to do. So, so I was always interested in the natural world. And I was always interested in, in learning and exploring. And in the, my goodness, when was it? It was in 19, oh, it was in 2000 was the very first time I, I did an a actual science project in a cave, and that was in Belize, Central America. And that was when I had my first experience with caves. I was always interested in bats, and I wanted to start working with bats. And I'd already done some projects with bats, and I was wanting to do that as my career, and then I went into a cave where they had a, in one of these rooms in the cave, had a quarter of a million bats. The bats were so noisy you couldn't even hear yourself think. And they were flying around, and it was just, it was just the most amazing experience that I ever had. 
And when I was in that cave in Belize, and I was in that, and I was in that room with all those bats, I was like, wow, this is cool. This is what I want to do. And I've been doing it ever since. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I love those kind of questions. I love hearing about how um, scientists, explorers, adventurers, what hooked them in the first place. And it's always really great stories like that from growing up and getting their hands dirty and, and experiencing things and then just never, maybe never fully growing up after that. I think that's important. <laughs> that's it. Not growing up. That's, that's, that is the most important thing to do. Always be curious. Always question things. Always, always wonder why. Always question and always be inquisitive and, and just and never let that die. And if you can keep that through your whole life, I think you know, it'll make life a lot more interesting. That's for sure. And it'll turn us and it'll make us a lot more. I think I think it'll make us better people in the long run. I can agree with that a hundred percent. Um, our last class, thank you for waiting so patiently, our grade six is in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, go ahead with some questions if we have a couple. You can wrap things up for us. Well, what's the most dangerous excursion you've ever been on, and if you've been on any dangerous excursions, have any people lost their life during it? Um, good question. Um, let's see. Well, well to, to address that, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the risks that I take are, are calculated risks. Um, we're very careful. We're very cautious because working underground and working in the backcountry, if something goes south, if something goes really wrong, it is really wrong really fast. And sometimes it takes a very long time for us to get that person out of the backcountry and to, to a hospital. So we have to be very, very careful. Um, we make plans. We have, we have what are called safety plans. We have, we have a cave search and rescue team for each one of my trips. I have a cave search and rescue team that is waiting for a phone call to be put into the field to come save us if anything happens. So planning is very important. In any research expedition, in any expedition, be it adventure or be it science-based, planning is the most important thing. You have to have a plan. And you have to have a plan for safety to make sure it, basically what we're doing is we're anticipating what is the what are all the things that could happen everything from skin in your knee to what happens if somebody breaks their femur bone and they have to be taken out of on a stretcher to safety so planning is very important but I would have to say the most well I fell off a cliff once um, that was perhaps the most dangerous thing that happened to me so far. Um, and uh, it, when I fell off the cliff, I was fine. I knew I was going to be all right. I grabbed a hold of a rock and I was fine. But I looked up at my buddy that was working with me and he was white. I mean, he was like, just he, he, th he, thought, he thought I was dead. He was scared half to death. He turned just like this pale white. We're like, oh my God. And I just started laughing. I was like, no, I'm fine. Let's go. And I climbed back up and we you know, continue doing what we're doing. Um, but having a plan and being careful especially when you're doing dangerous things, is most important. And it limits people falling off of cliffs. And what I, I, what I can also report, and I hope to continue this great knock on wood record, is that we've had no, no severe injuries in the field and no one has died on any of my trips. And I do plan to keep it that way. And by planning and being careful, I hope to do so. Okay. Uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, take us home with one more question. Thank you. You always said that from a young age you wanted to, to do this, but have you ever had any other ideas of what you wanted to be when you grew up? Um, yeah, you know, I was, I was, I had a, I wanted to be a lot of things. Um, I was, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to be when I was in college. And because of that, it's probably a good idea to figure that out <laughs> before you go into college because it took me six years to get through college because I didn't know what I wanted to do. When I finally got out of college, I was an archaeologist. I actually went into archaeology for almost three years before decide, realizing that I was supposed to be an ecologist. And I don't know why it took me that long because 
basically I grew up playing with bugs and playing with animals and studying animals and watching them and trying to figure out what do they eat and how do they eat it. And I, and I was an ecologist when I was your age. And I was always an ecologist. So, yes, I, it, it, I, I was on this sort of path, getting to my ultimate career. And now I'm, I'm very blessed in that, in addition to being an ecologist, I also get to play with robots, and, and I'll be wearing spacesuits at some point in the near future. So uh, I think I have the best of both worlds. I get to, to uh, work with rocket scientists, and I get to you know, work in caves. Doesn't get any better than that. It sounds pretty good, and I'm sure some of that archaeology training does come in handy. Um, with what you do exploring the cave, especially if you come across some artifacts or things like that. Oh yeah, it really does because that, that training in archaeology has, has basically trained my eyes to where I, I see things that, that folks who are not trained in archaeology do not see. And oftentimes the archaeological materials in caves are more important. Those artifacts are going to be more important than the bugs because those are associated with humans and they're going to be very important to whoever owns that cave because they want to protect those artifacts. All right. Well, classrooms, thank you so much for joining us from all over for your excellent questions and listening. Jut, thanks for an awesome presentation taking us from Earth and uh, to other planets and future exploration. Really appreciate you uh, taking your time to be with us this afternoon. Thank you, Joe, and thank you so much, everyone. All right, I'm going to turn on the microphones and we'll get a little hey, is, thank you. Here we go. Thank you. It's always the fun part. Thanks Hello. everybody for hanging out today. And uh, we're signing off.